It's basically like, I went bonkers, I got locked up, and this is what happened, and this is the journey. I want to make people know that mental health affects everyone. So some people could look at me and go, oh my God, she was naked, she was in the House of Parliament. I was still crying when I went home. If I can do something to stop somebody else um, being extremely sad, then I've done something good. First stop, possibly the thing I'm most famous for. This is the first time I've been back since I was plastered all over it. Perfect opportunity for me to tell you my version of events. I got asked to do a photo shoot. They said, we're going to put it on the cover, which was kind of like, that's rather nice. Yeah. Woke up one morning and I heard my name on the BBC News and there was my bottom over there. <laughs> they had projected it onto the Houses of Parliament as a publicity stunt for FHM's 100 Sexiest Women. And I never even won. I think people thought it was a career move. It absolutely wasn't. Knew nothing about it. And then when you start got the negative comments, I was starting to feel depressed again, thinking I don't want to leave the house. But I knew that every time I went out, I had to do this. You gotta laugh, do you? Do you have to laugh? I've not got much longer on this planet, so do you know what? I'm gonna keep smiling every single day. In 1995, I started my career as a kids' TV presenter. Kids' TV was just fun. Who would not want to just get dressed up and run around? I just like being a kid. I think I never grew up, really. My dad used to say I was like Peter Pan. One of the first people I got to know well at the time was my co-presenter, Grant Stott. I'm interested to know what impression I made on him back then. You were just so natural and you were at home with the camera. And, I was uh, just happy. Yeah. I was so yeah. delighted to be doing that job. I was a bit excitable, I think. Well, we both were. Oh, yeah, I, I think, think we were just excited were. to be working on telly. I would never eat anything that they gave me on the telly. So I'd like pretend. Was there a moment where you went, I've got anorexia? Or was it a moment that somebody said something to you? I think um, when I got banned from my gym, I went to my gym and I passed out and then I got taken to hospital. And um, I remember the nurse just saying to me, you, you just need a jam sandwich or something. And I was like, are you crazy? I'm not going to eat a jam sandwich. And I thought, this is, this is bad. I wouldn't listen to anyone. Or I'd pretend to make them stop fussing. Because you can't, you can't tell someone what to do. Yeah. I still think I'm fat. I still struggle with um, every day. Because I kind of like, I'm getting old now. I'd think by the time that I'm my age that maybe I would have got over it, but I don't think I'll ever get over it, to be honest with you. It's the milkman. <laughs> I'm getting a visit from someone who knew me at the height of my fame and saw firsthand how being a national celebrity affected me. Chris Curry was a huge part of the best part of my life. So that's when I was doing Top of the Pops and Chris was um, producer and director. I, I think I got depressed because I thought, do you know, am I good enough? Am I not good enough? Um... You were good enough uh, and you still are good enough. And I don't think anyone can tell you otherwise. But now I'd like to think that people are getting a handle on mental health and people are kind of starting to think twice. But unless you're careful, there can be, there can be casualties. And um, we must try and avoid that happening to people at all costs. <laughs> Bye, sweetheart. Be good. Me? Seriously? Be careful, then. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I always thought I was never good enough for anything. I think I just crumbled for a while. I don't know what happened. I've still got that and as I crumbled, that, um, I did stopping. something that shames me to this day. Obviously, self-harming was not the, um, the best thing I've ever done in my entire life. But for whatever reason, I did it. And then I got tattoos to cover up. It, it and now I look back and I think, oh my God, what a terror. Do you know what, if, I, if I happened to anybody else, I'd just be like shaking them going, what's wrong with you? I did it for almost 10 years. I mean, my whole body. 
Today, I'm going to the Royal Edinburgh Hospital to meet Merrick Pope, Scotland's only self-harm nurse specialist. So these are the only ones I've got left, but okay. you know, these were really deep. They were down to the bone when it uh -huh. was done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you couldn't have done anything with that. Merrick helps her patients manage the complex emotions behind self-harm. She's the go-to woman in her field, so I'm hoping to learn a lot. What we would do would be matched to the colour that you are today. OK. One of Merrick's many jobs is running a skin camouflage clinic to cover up her patient's scars. And where do you think it comes from, self-harming? I think we all self-harm. Do you? Yeah. I think in different ways. Yeah. Generally, we're not very good about looking after ourselves and coping in ways that are healthy. So we don't phone our counsellor and have a massage and eat an organic salad when we've had a rubbishy day. No. You eat chips. <laughs> you pick a fight with your partner because I've left their pants on the floor yet again. Have Smoke a bags. <laughs> <laughs> and then cut yourself, yeah. yeah. And it's about you know, so, what's kind of yeah. culturally acceptable at different points. Merrick was a superstar. If you can have, like, self-harm superstars, she was a self-harm superstar helper. <laughs> I've been to see colleagues. I've been to see friends. I've gone back to places I never wanted to go back to. But it's family who form us. Hello, Dad. Hi, <laughs> Gail. <laughs> How are you? Oh, it's nice to see you. Yes. It's a perfect little girl. So it's, it's only when she grew up. <laughs> Children and parents, they often tell little, yeah. white, little white lies just to make one party or the other one feel good about it. That and I really worried when uh, you started to admit to self-harming. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. These things were worry parents. What would you do if Honey said I've been self-harming? I, I wouldn't know what I'd do. So what happened when I grew up? Uh, I put it down to perhaps going down to London. OK. Mm -hmm. So I let you down? <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. OK. You didn't let me down, you let yourself down. So, uh, anyway, you're all better now. Yes, exactly. I'm all good now. Yes, and you know who to phone if yeah. you've got a problem. Ghostbusters. <laughs> yeah, kind of upsetting a little bit. He kind of blames everything on me and London. But he's my dad. So today we're going to the hospital to speak to a psychiatrist and he's doing a diagnostic interview. So he's going to ask me lots of questions and then figure out where I'm all at. So are you judging me? I have been observing you. Go on Look. then, do I get to know? So I think that you've got certainly tendencies of a uh, borderline nature, is how I would put it. So what does it mean, borderline? It's characterised by you know, intense relationships, impulsive, reckless behaviour. Self-cutting is very often a part of it. People with borderline traits are at increased risk of both anorexia and depression. And they've got a better label, which is emotionally unstable <laughs> personality Can I disorder. Have that? <laughs> you can. So see if I go on Tinder. Yeah. Can I right. put all these things? Borderline, mm, emotionally you. unstable. <laughs> <laughs> if you did have an emotionally unstable personality, mm -hmm. doesn't sound like you do anymore. Okay. So I don't. I do. I think you probably did. Okay. But probably do not anymore. Okay. 